everybody. Can I get your attention, please? Can I get quiet, please? Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming tonight. What a great turnout. Marty and I both appreciate that. Um, before I get started, I want to thank Natasha Clark for letting us host this event here. She donated the venue, so if anyone wants to put a dollar or two in the box on the way out, that would be appreciated. If not, no big deal. But it was, it was her, her um, voluntarily donating this. I did read uh, that a few people have said that they wanted to uh, boycott her business because we're hosting this here and I would hope that most people would um, would actually give more business because she's doing this um, service to the public I also want to thank Mark Garman with Vallejo Independent Bulletin he's filming this And unfortunately, the Times Herald did not want to print our press release in the newspaper. So thanks to Mark, this is the way it's going to get out to the public. Wow. So I am also going to start out with a little bit on, on rules of behavior. We, do, we have this in council meetings, but there's, there's different rules, First Amendment rights, etc. Here, we're not going to take people disrupting the meeting. You can say your opinions, you can think what you want, it can be contrary to what we think, that's perfectly fine. But don't take someone else's time when they're speaking or asking a question. We want people to be able to hear other people and hear each other and, and not any boos and cat calls. Um, and so there are folks around the room that if there are, if there are people that want to disrupt it, then, then you'll just be asked to leave very quietly. But I'm sure y'all are gonna be extremely well behaved, I can tell. Um, <laughs> And then also um, a legal disclaimer, Marty and I want to make sure that uh, everyone knows that we are not going to be speaking about current negotiations with our employee labor unions in any way whatsoever. We will not be even talking about the budget as it relates to that in any way whatsoever tonight. It's a legal issue, we're staying away from it, so if you ask that question we don't answer it. Please don't think that we're not being helpful, it's just, it's just a process that needs to happen and. and we do believe in good faith bargaining. So with that, I think that's my, okay. And then also, I'd like to thank some candidates that showed up tonight. Um, Chris Platzer, are you here, Chris? <laughs> Chris Platzer. <laughs> Joanne Shively. <laughs> and Leah Meisenheimer. Okay, um, I'm gonna begin. Marty, we're gonna kinda interplay a little bit, um, talk back and forth, and then we're gonna open it up to questions from, from you folks. And by no means are we the experts on everything, so um, I think there's a lot of knowledge in this room also that we can all benefit from. Um, for myself, I talked to Marty and I said, you know, I, I really felt like we needed to host a forum to talk about what we've been through as council members, what we've been through as a city, because of what I was seeing with this um, new slate of candidates called Jumpstart Vallejo, and, um, and the money that's being poured into this election. And that really concerned me, because when I started out in 2005, I first ran in 05, and I was very young and extremely naive, <laughs> and, um, I went to the endorsement interviews for the unions, and at the end of the interviews, it, it was quite an interview. It was basic, basically me and Kurt Henke the whole time. But um, at the end of the interview, one of the union members asked me, if we endorse you, will you stay bought? And I was just so shocked at that. And naive, probably, yes, but so shocked that, that it would be such a blatant um, question. And when I repeated it later in the, at the community forums, they got mad at me and I said, well, don't ask it if you don't, you know, if you're embarrassed about hearing it repeated. Um, my husband, Tony Pearsall, when he ran for office, I don't know where he is, um, when he ran for city council, he was a, just retired as a police captain after 36 years. And he was asked, 
you are used to giving orders. If we endorse you, will you be ready to take them? So I say this not to union bash, because I don't, I, I don't think that all unions are bad. I just think that in Vallejo, our unions have controlled, disproportionately controlled the city. And um, this, these same people that ask me these questions are behind this Jumpstart Vallejo. And so that's my concern, and that's why I wanted to come and talk about it. Because we've been through so much in the last 10 years, eight years for me. Um, it, it's about economic justice. This has been about economic justice for me. Um, yes, we want a happy, well-paid workforce. We want citizens who are happy and have great services. We want that combination. When I came in in 2005, the city was completely dysfunctional. I, it was a mess. We had, we had the head of the fire union, Kurt Hankey, suing former council members, suing for former council members, current council members, um, citizens. He had threatened sit, suing citizens for defamation, and, and it was creating this, it was an attempt to create a chilling effect on, on, on speaking out. And, um, we, we stopped it. We, we pushed back against that. And my, one of the first things that um, we looked at when I, was, when I came in was whether we, the city, wanted def to defend the current and former council members from this defamation lawsuit, and we chose to for a reason. We chose to because we didn't want that to set a precedent in the future that anyone can just threaten lawsuits to silence council members from speaking out. You elect us to speak out. You elect us to speak out for you. So we had at that point too, we had like, I think it was like $6 million in deferred raises that were due. And the contract was up for re renegotiation and they wanted to uh, defer it again, defer the raises and extend the contract. And we said no. And I think it's the first time that they were told no. And it was a big mess. Um, we had to make cuts instead, and we were taken to arbitration over that, and we lost, and it was this big spiral from there into bankruptcy. Um, I knew that it was going to be painful. When I came on, I knew that I was going to make people uncomfortable, because I'm, I, I say things as they are, and, and I'm not afraid of it, and I'm not afraid of everything that I've been called, and things that have been done to me, I don't care. I believe it's my responsibility as a citizen to step out and speak up against injustice. And what was happening to Vallejo was unjust. What was happening to our taxpayers was unjust. Our services were being impacted as the special interests were buying city councils for years and years before that. And, and you know, the previous councils are at fault too. Because A, they answered yes when they were asked if they'd be bought, and, and they followed it. I, I've, I've definitely seen it. They definitely followed it. Um, and they also made promises they couldn't keep, and they shouldn't have. But it was easier for them. It was much easier for them to defer raises that they'd given and extend contracts than deal with the problem, you know, the, the structural imbalance at the time. And so when I came on, I had all of that mess, and it really pissed me off. You know, and I made a vow at that point that I would not leave to future councils what was left to me. I would not take that easy road out and, 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 and leave a big mess and defer the problems. A lot harder, of course, difficult road, but it was the right thing to do. So it brought discomfort, but I think what we also brought to Vallejo is we brought change. And it was a needed change. We had to shake things up, and boy, did bankruptcy shake us up, yeah? Um, we didn't get everything changed the way we needed to, but I think we've started that change in a positive, um, in a positive way. And we did it. We did it as a community. You know, it wasn't just me. It wasn't just six council members, five, four, three, two. It was all of us working together in different ways that stood up and said we weren't going to do this anymore. So, you know, I've been able to, you know, after we had to lob the bombs and you know, everything got kind of crazy. We get into bankruptcy, we're getting out, and we're trying to work together. You know, the mayor and I, 
Mayor and Marty, I mean, we have figured out how to work together. We have differences, definitely have differences, but we realized that to move things forward, sometimes we had to figure out how to work together to get them to move. And that was really, really important. So I'm extremely disappointed to see this jumpstart effort start because it's dividing us again. It's taking us back into those days of chaos. And, and just at a time when we're starting to heal, as we're starting to move forward and, 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 and get out of bankruptcy and become a positive, beautiful, vibrant city, it's, it's just wrong. And, and so what I want people to know from my personal opinion, my personal experience, please follow the money. There's a reason why a real estate pack from Los Angeles is giving $8,000 to jumpstart. There's a reason why a firefighter pack in San Francisco is giving money to jumpstart. And it's not to make your lives and your neighborhoods better. So that's just my quick request, my little summary of what I've been through. And, um, and we'll take questions later. I know Marty wants to talk about what we have done. And I think this building off of what I was saying We've made, we, we, we had the chaos, now we're moving forward, and, and we actually are accomplishing a lot by working together. So. so I, I, I know that you have these polls here, so you know, I, I could run back and forth and try to <laughs> make sure you can all see us. Um, you know, when Stephanie first proposed having this meeting, I thought about it and I was like, yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. We should do that. And then we started, you know, kind of thinking about out loud what this would be about. And I realized that one of the things that has been um, bothering me with this campaign, and in particular with Jumpstart Vallejo, is, is some of the way that the majority council is being characterized that I really think is unfair and just simply inaccurate. And um, one of the things that between their robocalls and their direct mail, they have charged the majority council, of which obviously Stephanie and I are a part of, as well as Bob and Robert, as being you know inactive, obstructionists, and divisive. And you know my recollection for the first two years when I was on the council and I was in the minority on the council, I don't remember the then majority be, being called divisive. So I guess divisive is when you don't agree with the other side. Then they're divisive, apparently. So um, I find it interesting because I just think we just have a different way of getting to success for the city. That's the way I view it. I don't view it as divisive. So I think that's very unfortunate. We have made a list of the things that we've accomplished since December of 2011. It's on a bright yellow flyer out there. Um, I don't know if anybody's had a chance to get one, but you know, please be sure to get one. Um, so you can then decide for yourself if we've been inactive and obstructionists. I don't think we have. I think we've been very, very active and I'm very proud of our record. The other thing I wanted to, to just talk a little bit about is sort of the Jumpstart Vallejo pack and kind of connecting the dots a little bit. Um, if you look at the political action committees that have endorsed Jumpstart Vallejo and the amount of money that's there, it really begs the question, what's kind of the objective? And the way I explain it to people is, if I donate $1,000 to Stephanie's campaign, I'm supporting her, because I, I believe in, in, in the same things that she believes in, but I also, in fairness, you know, I want a certain amount of access. When she gets elected, and I have problems down at the planning department, not that that ever happens, mind you, <laughs> but <laughs> that I call her up and she will return my phone call within a reasonable amount of time. And, you know, 24 to 48 hours. Okay, maybe not. Um, <laughs> and help me resolve my problem, right? I, I was a large major donor. Okay. Well, when a political action committee gives a large donation to a slate or an individual candidate, they come with a set of objectives that are very clearly about either preventing or advancing legislation that will benefit their profession. It's very different. So usually there's quite literally things like, I'd like binding interest arbitration back on the ballot, or things like, I don't like um, a rental inspection program. You know, it's, it's very specific things and it's very specific to um, those individuals' professions. And it's not the same as just saying they're just teachers and iron workers and, you know, not when you join with everybody in your profession, you're coming with a goal and objective that protects the interests of your profession, quite fairly. That's the way I view it. Having been the president of my former employee association and vice president, having sat at the negotiation tables three times, 
I can tell you, you know, I don't go into, I didn't ever go into negotiations thinking about the best interests of the citizens of Sacramento. I'm going to be blunt. That's not what, I, that isn't who I was representing. I was re representing 101 employees in my employee association, and I was going to the table with their best interests, which makes sense. I represent them. I wasn't elected to office. I was elected to be a president of an employee association. So I just think that, you know, it's important to connect those kinds of dots and think about it a little bit differently than just, you know, that's, you know, a political action committee is just the same as an individual donation because it really is not at all. And so I found it, you know, just very troubling that the way that this majority council is being, um, being talked about when I really don't think that that's what we've done. And I think that we're supporting some really strong candidates that will continue to be you know, independent thinkers on the council and will continue the same kind of path that we've already started in the last 21 months. And I would just end by saying, you know, I apologize that we aren't able to unravel the last several decades of poor city management in 21 months. With that, I think we're gonna open it up. Yeah. Yeah, I was talking to the city manager the other day, and he said, um, he looked, and, and in my tenure of eight years, we had six city managers, and only two of them were even permanent. So there's been a lot of chaos. They want us in the front. Okay, and we will when we do the questions. Thank you, David. You want to see us. Um, just a couple of extra things I want to talk about money. Um, you know, when we had the Measure A campaign, which removed binding interest arbitration from our charter, the... Uh, Citizens of Vallejo joined together and raised, I think it was $9,000 by having potlucks and all that kind of stuff. And um, the other side, a PAC that tried to defeat it, um, which was composed of mostly VPOA, but they raised almost $160,000. There's a reason for this. And there's a, people ask, why Vallejo? There's a reason why Vallejo, because typically it's easier to pick on a smaller government unit you know, we're small, we don't have a lot of resources, we don't have a lot of money to fight lawsuits, so let Vallejo be the one to set the precedent. And um, removing binding interest arbitration was really important for us, but it was really important for them not to let it happen statewide. But we, the citizens, won. And that was 2010. And, and I just want to note that that is a question being asked of, of the candidates by this PAC, um, if they would consider putting binding interest arbitration back on the ballot. So 30 years of having binding interest arbitration, 41, 41 years, excuse me, of having binding interest arbitration, three years of not, two years of not having it. I'd say we should give it a few more years to see how it's working, or not. And I know J.D. Miller's here, and he's probably itching to talk about money, but I also want to note the importance of having a council who's going to make strong, smart financial decisions. Um, we have PERS who has shortfalls. They're not making accurate, um, um, what do you call it, projections, correct? Thank you. And, you know, in 2011, we were paying CalPERS $11 million, 14% of our budget, and now we're paying 15 million, and that's 18% of our budget, and that's only going up. And so, no, we're not out of the woods yet. So we need to make sure we have a council that is elected that's gonna make smart financial decisions, first thinking of, of you, first thinking of the city, and, and how the city's going to benefit or not benefit from the decisions that were made. And, and it's, it's absolutely, positively critical. So I, I I, for myself, for the eight years that I've, I've fought and, and given my health and my blood, sweat, and tears, I ask that you please elect a council that's independent. I'm not going to tell you who to elect. Just make sure they're independent, please. So and we're going to open up to question. I just want to add something. I also wanted to just say that, you know, I really tonight do not want to discuss or talk about individual candidates. Um, and I want to say straight up that the Jumpstart Vallejo slate of candidates, I have a, a lot of respect for all of them. I know them all personally. I like them. I think they're smart, and I think they have good intentions. The, the issue here for me tonight is that good intentions often get derailed 
by the debts that we can owe people who got us elected to office. And we just can't afford to owe anything to anyone except to all of you. So I'll leave you with that. If people have questions, you want to come up to the microphone and, um, and ask it, and we can try to answer. There may be some other folks we can call on in the audience to answer. Um, who's going to be the first victim? Come on up. I was always intrigued when J.D. spoke at the council meetings and pointed out that we had reinvented the wheel a number of times and they never got approved to move monies into reserve funds and other areas that would have been significant for the protection of Vallejo. And I would like to understand the motivation behind that because I'm not an economics person, but I am interested in that sort of information. Because it's, it's what you would do with your own budget, right? You have a savings account. Um, I think this goes back to the easy decisions of deferring and extending contracts. It was easier to dip into that savings account to pay for, for expenses than to try and get the cuts that were needed perhaps at the time to make the changes that were needed because they're politically difficult and could be the end of a political career, actually. So it was a lot easier to dip into your savings than to fight the fight. And that's why. And, and that's one thing that we've been doing coming out of bankruptcy is we're starting to rebuild that reserve. Because going into bankruptcy, you know, I mean, at the very end, we had to zero it out. There's, you know, trying to, trying desperately to stay um, away from going into bankruptcy. And it was, it was awful. It was a horrible feeling. And I, I would just add the other thing is, is that when we had 41 years of binding interest arbitration in the charter, it was invoked 25 times. And so what frequently happens is that, you know, binding interest arbitration and arbitrators, um, it, even the ones from Wisconsin, the last one we had, oftentimes uh, side with the side of labor. And, uh, and they often look at what you've historically done. They don't look... Um, at the actual budget and what you can afford. And they don't look at all the other labor contracts you might be negotiating or that you have to divvy up the pie with. They look at the narrow confines of that contract and historically what you've already provided. So if you're constantly having to over provide because somebody else is making the decision based on one slice of the pie, there won't ever be any reserve left. There won't be any money left to have a reserve for times like the times that we've been in the last three to four years. You're magic, huh? <laughs> um, hi, my name is Joanne. Um, there has been a, I would like to know what your experience is with all the consultants that have been hired over the last eight to ten years, because I think there's kind of a little bit of a public perception that we spend a lot of money on consultants, we don't necessarily see what the results are, and we're kind of thinking that's not a good thing to continue. So I'd like to hear your experience with that in the last eight, ten years. And by the way, thank you very bo both very much. Um, one thing I would say, um, having been a local government employee for um, a decade until this past year and uh, in a redevelopment agency in Sacramento and before that the city of Berkeley, it's very, very common in local government to use a lot of consultants. You couldn't possibly hire all the people all the time that you need for every possible thing that comes up in local government. So my experience, and, and Stephanie's may be different, is that, that we do that anyways in local government, but B, we are so thinly staffed. And I, I, I appreciate that more and more people who work with the city, consultants that I know personally Personally, not just that, that have that have worked for us and have been really honest with us and said I've worked in a lot of cities with not much staff but boy you guys are like thinner than thin and I so what ends up happening is we end up hiring even more consultants than a normal public agency because we just you know aren't able to afford um, as you all know and, and you've all experienced personally I'm sure 
the, the number of um, staff that we need in every department, not just public safety, in every department. We do not have enough planners in the planning department in economic development. We have one you know, economic development staff and one manager. So they couldn't possibly have the talent and skills to do everything from Mare Island to the downtown to the waterfront that we could possibly need. So um, I do think we have more than we need to, but I also think we're in a position right now where we don't have great choices. There's also a lot of laws and regulations that we have to comply with that, you know, they're very onerous, and, um, but you have to do them, and some, a lot of times we don't have the in-house skills for that. I agree with Marty, we, we, we do have too much. I will make a little peg for the, um, this current city manager, though, uh, Dan Keene. He truly has brought um, professional management to Vallejo, and, and a really... Um, professional eye to hiring new employees, building up his staffs, and creating a good, strong employee um, and, and city. So, and I think that's only going to get better. And I think Dan would 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 reduce the use of of uh, consultants as he builds up his employees. Hi, council members. Um, you know me. Uh, so. It, it seems like people want to be on council because you know they they want to affect change. Their community members they want to affect change for the most part. Um, when you, I would like for you to talk a little bit about kind of that surprise of when you actually became council members and what kind of the priority uh, uh, in priority the the bulk of your um, time spent on council was focused on, not issues per se. What I'm driving towards is um, having <laughs> having heard so much about budgets. It concerns me that none of the people coming in on this jumpstart campaign really seem to have a fiscal background, except for Verter Liga. She's a very nice person, but let's just say she was at the helm during a disastrous part of our school board. Um, and. I know that several of the, the candidates that I support have a strong fiscal background. Talk to us about what you think is, ends up being the, the, the most important thing you have to focus on as council members, because it seems to me it's budget, budget, contracts, budget, fiscal, and I have this great unease with looking at this slate of people who really have very junior, if any, just basic personal financial experience versus something more substantial. Please speak to that. Thanks. Um, I'll start. I've had eight years. Um, and, and probably my, my biggest regret um, in, in acknowledgement as coming into council is that I couldn't get done all these grand things that I wanted to do, like improve in terms of like quality of life, neighborhood improvements, um, that darn leaf blower ordinance update that I wanted. <laughs> still not going to get um, because we had such dire financial crisis and um, and labor labor union um, discord so my term two terms have mostly been focused on that you're right and and unfortunately um, I didn't get the previous council's uh, pleasure of enjoying being a council member of walking into a room and having people say, hey, Stephanie's here, let me buy you a drink, how great. It's, ne it's never been like that. It's, it's been. <laughs> um, because they were making decisions that people liked. Um, and I was saying things that made people uncomfortable. But so it was more focused on budget and, and um, negotiations my entire eight years. And this last year and a half, two years um, since coming out of bankruptcy has been the only time that we've started to focus on, on other things um, in addition to budget and, and negotiations. And I think as a council member, I think that's got to be, uh, eventually it's going to go back to where it's a little bit more, uh, a lot more policy making and, and I hope a le lot less of, of the crunching, the numbers crunching, the eyeballs, I have need glasses now from all those dumb numbers, or maybe it's my age. Um, but I, I, I do think that, I hope that changes. I really do. It, but it's not going to change immediately. So the people that we do get elected are going to need to hit the ground running quickly. We're going to still be in the, who knows, I'm not going to say that. 
Um, I thank you. Um, we still have some budget issues and uh, things that need to be rebuilt and, and, and changed. So, you know, I, I hope that if we get these independent candidates in there that they can continue on this, this solid foundation that we built, growing it up so that we can start making policy again. I think also a lot of people expect council members to do, you know, a thousand things. And really, we are policy makers. You know, a lot of times they talk about economic development. You're not bringing in the big businesses. Shame on you. That's not my job. My job is to make the policies that make it um, beneficial and easy and attractive for businesses to come to Vallejo. And it's the economic development department's job and it's city staff's job. It's that guy back there at the Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> it's their job to help, you know, help us bring in new businesses. So remember that council members are policy mem makers and we're also part time. Um, not a lot of us have the, the option of, of putting full time into this. So I just also like you to, when you look at your council members in the future, give any of them and all of them slightly bit of a break because it's pretty hard to work a full time job and do this at the same time. Yeah, I would just add to that. I would really like to try living on $10,000 a year. Just kidding. I don't want to live on that. But, but I just can't do it. So yes, it's really challenging. You know, I've, this is my first term coming to an end right now. And so the, for the first two years, I'd agree with Stephanie, I think, uh, uh, of my term anyways, that I felt like there was a lot more really heavy duty number crunching. And, and if, you know, I think for me personally, because I work, I've worked in local government for a decade, I did budgets at work all the time for the redevelopment areas I worked in. I worked with $26 million budgets for two redevelopment areas. And I know the structure. It's not a budget like a business. It's not that kind of budget. It doesn't work like that. And so I was you know, pretty much able to come in and hit the ground running. And I think you, you know, it's, it's really, really hard, I think, if you don't have some of that kind of background. And I will just say that I think I've seen some of my colleagues at times struggle. And um, I think you know, in part, it's maybe because they haven't done that kind of work. Again, like I said, it, government budgets, totally different thing from a private sector business budget. They're just very different. And there's so many regulations about what you can and cannot do with different funds. And most people, you know, they have really good intentions. They get elected, but they don't really appreciate or fully understand. I mean, I still run into people who follow, gov you know, follow the city politics fairly well and will say stuff to me, I'm like, you just can't do that. I can't just go take redevelopment money and hire, you know, police officers. It just doesn't, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I joke with people about the video Schoolhouse Rock. Anybody, I aged myself, remember that? I'm just a bill. I'm like, I want one for local government. We need, because because that doesn't, the, <laughs> yeah, they do. You're right, you're right. But um, I also want to say, I've been a little bit selfish. I, I'll admit that in terms of, my approach to my term and I have you know kind of focused on things that I'm really really excited and interested about and when the budget comes I read it I do my homework and when we vote and we're done I go back to like the stuff that I am passionate about because <laughs> you know it's part time so you got to fill you got to fill that time with some of the stuff that you're passionate about and so I've kind of you know been a person that I do my homework and I do my job but I'm not gonna carry it around with me day in and day out. But I have the luxury of having a background that allows me to do that. I had the luxury of coming in and already having an awful lot of knowledge about local government and budgets. And like I said, a lot of people um, running this year and in prior years don't have that. Any more questions? First and then over there. Oh wait, it's a race. Okay. Sorry. Uh, uh, my name is Zachary Church. Um, I have a few, not a few, but I have a question regarding the, uh, the school district. I know this is kind of not the place for it, but I would still like to get it out there. Um, the, regarding the grand jury verdict on Vallejo High School safety regulations and conduct and how the whole school goes as a whole, but also just the whole school district. I, I've seen that they've been working with with making things a bit more safer and they've been and someone I quoted them as they were said they were being voluntarily vague with the way they were handling everything um, I'm not seeing too much change like yeah unfortunately really weak 
that's not in our purview. Um, I would I would take that to the school board meeting and ask that very question. I think we, a lot of people share that. And then there was someone over here next. Okay, and then Ann, you can go third. Hi, I'm Kim. Um, so I hope you didn't already answer this while I was looking for parking. Maybe you did. Um, should I put in a complaint about parking? <laughs> um, <laughs> we just fixed it out here. We have the angle uh, parking. Right. Um, so anyway, I was you. You talked about follow money, which I think is really important. And um, you, I would say maybe we could say con con conjecture about um, the union reasons for having this slate in terms of binding arbitration, but it is kind of an odd um, combination of people that are supporting that slate. So I'm wondering if you have any conjecture to offer about why real estate would be interested in um, the same group of people and why um, the chamber would be interested in the same group of people in terms of helping us follow the money. I will start with a couple guesses, <laughs> and they're just my guesses. Uh, real estate. One of the things that we are working on is a uh, rental inspection and landlord um, um, registration program. And, and, and I asked to also have, have uh, landlords be uh, required to get business licenses in Vallejo. Um, and the real estate uh, groups, I don't think like that. Um, we, I worked with, with a group of people, including someone from a, the real estate, um, and we did come up with an ordinance, I think, that was kind of middle of the ground, but it got dropped along the way. But I do, I do think that that might be the reason. Um, and as far as chamber, we have someone from the chamber here, but I'm going to make my guess anyways. Um, we, I think it's probably about development. And in my personal opinion, and it's, it's not a slam on anybody, but in Vallejo, we've had a lot of anything is good. And um, if there's a proposal from a developer, it wasn't looked at critically, does it fit here? Is it right for Vallejo? It's more of, oh great, what can we do for you? Um, recently is a perfect example. Callahan da Silva wanted to put, pay a dollar for our waterfront property to put a government office on it. And in the past, I'm sure that would have been approved. But in this council majority, we, we did not approve it, rightfully so. Office buildings do not belong on a lot of them. There's also just some, some interesting oddities with this. You know, the chamber um, wrote a letter, Pip and Do actually wrote a letter to the county asking them to bring the Proly Day Center to Vallejo. Um, very odd. Um, not, not quite sure. And, and also, what, what's, what's a, a different thing if you typically look at cities, and I haven't figured this one out, but usually labor and chamber of commerce aren't together. So the, the oddity there is, and perhaps what it is, is control. And sometimes you need to, to get together, join to get forces together to fight this wave of change coming, and maybe that's what they just decided to do. The other thing I, I would add is, um, you know, back in 2010, I, I uh, co-chaired Yes on Measure A to remove binding interest arbitration from the city charter with Jim Libyan, and, um, and the chamber endorsed that. And now uh, the chamber has endorsed the Jumpstart slate, but on the slate there are a lot of labor political action committees and as um, Stephanie said earlier, they have been asking in their endorsement interviews, will you consider putting binding interest arbitration back on the ballot? So, you know, that's a pretty huge thing um, in itself. And you have, I think, I'm just guessing, a conflict of interest there. So I think, you know, that, that is something that I find, uh, uh, you know, really troubling, especially as somebody that, you know, I do identify myself as a labor person. Um, so, but I, of the old school shared sacrifice labor. So um, I, I think that that's a really troubling um, matchup on the jumpstart endorsement list. Um, and I don't think you were here when I said earlier, Kim, that I, that I think, um, you know, political action committees, you know, are trying to advance or prevent legislation that adversely impacts or positively impacts their professions. 
And it's different than when individual people give donations, which is about usually the betterment of, you know, my community. I, I you know, when I donate to people's campaign, I don't think, I'm not thinking, I've got this ordinance I want passed, and if you'll carry the water, it's, it's not that simple, simple, right? It's, you know, it's more about, I care about my city, and I think, we, I think you reflect similar values as I do, even if we don't agree on everything. I, and I think I, I said it, but I, I think, too, that there is this, this citizen movement that's been happening in Vallejo over this last 10 years, and the citizens have become very strong and outspoken and powerful. And, um, and I believe that, that there are those that are afraid of that, as they should be, because that's how people change things. That's, that's how people change the world. So I think perhaps there's unholy alliances that need to be made. Uh, you know, LNG, the liquefied natural gas battle, same thing. You know, I had just moved to Vallejo, and here the firefighters were, you know, promoting it and, and with the chamber, and I was kind of going, huh? But firefighters wanted the jobs, and the chamber wanted the jobs and the money, so they got together. So there are unholy alliances sometimes, and then sometimes they're not. Politics makes strange bedfellows. That is one of my lessons. And, and you can never, you know, you, you never know who you're going to be on the same side of uh, on issues at certain times. So next question was over here. He was next, and then Ann, and then there's somebody in the back. Okay. My name is Stanley Hutter, um, and I'm going to admit to some pretty gross ignorance. I wonder if you could tell us what were the major budget elements that caused the bankruptcy and what are the major elements that are going to make the city uh, financially sound? <laughs> okay, we have two hours left. Yeah. Oh, yeah. JD. Oh, oh, oh. Um, okay, the question was, uh, what were the major uh, um, monetary, what caused the bankruptcy and, and what are we going to do to make it different? I said, you go first. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'll be very simplistic about it because we could talk about it forever and JD could too and I might even let him have a minute um, to give his spiel. <laughs> okay, minute and a half. Um, but really, you got to look back to the Navy base closed and we lost, a, we lost our economic base. That's number, A, number one, and it created this big vacuum. Um, we, we didn't have revenue anymore and we had to figure out how to create revenue. And I wasn't here at the time. I wish I was. I wish we would have stopped and taken a big deep breath collectively and said, okay, we aren't, haven't had to bring in business to Vallejo. We've had the Navy here forever. Let's bring in some experts. Let's get some guidance. But we didn't. It seemed like we just rushed headlong into Lennar and some other things um, without really truly having a plan. Um, so there, the revenues weren't, weren't building. And then at the same time, we were uh, in that vacuum, the employee unions became stronger. And they started getting councils to make their contracts better and better and better. So while our revenues were going down, our expenses were going up. And, um, and it continued that way. By deferring raises, continually deferring raises, and, by, um, and, and extending contracts instead of addressing deficits, they just extended the problem until, unfortunately, then the economy started slowing and we had this perfect storm in Vallejo. But really, the, the, ultimate, the ultimate cause was this disparity and um, once you make promises to labor, especially in California, you, you can't get them back. So we're gonna have to, you know, we have to replace that with revenue. Um, but also we have to take control of our purse strings and we did that by removing binding interest arbitration from the charter. So I think that contributed um, also to, to having these contracts continually spiraling up and up and up. Um, Marty and then I don't know, JD, if you want to say something quickly. Quick, quickly. <laughs> I just wanted to add that, you know, the, when I first got on the council, one of the things that amazed me the most was when the um, director of finance told me we had, like in the first six months on the council, that we had lost $20 million in 18 months because of property and sales tax just plummeting. And as you all know, we didn't have the, the Navy here then either, so we didn't have that economic engine. And as Stephanie said, it really was the perfect storm. The thing that I would add, though, again, is, is you know, it, it, it isn't all this, but those elements, no Navy, plummeting property and sales tax in an 18 to 24 month period, 
along with the unsustainable labor contracts that we've historically had, um, has just really created a situation where the city got to a tipping point and couldn't get out. And and I, you know, I feel like I can really speak to this now that I've been on the council for four years. You know, binding interest arbitration did not help at all. Um, as I said before, you know, it was invoked 25 times in 41 years. That means every 18 months we were in some sort of binding interest arbitration for 41 years with one of our four labor unions um, since, you know, 1969 to 2010. So. I, and, and I, you know, as I also said, the arbitrators, uh, labor arbitrators, typically side with labor, and so, and they typically look at the historical aspects of what's already been given in past contracts, and they don't look at the whole budget. So I think that that combination together really uh, brought us to this, you know, the precipice where we found ourselves in 08, where we ended up having to file for bankruptcy. The way out is clearly to continue to control spending. We have to continue to make that a focus, but it can't be the only thing by any stretch. Um, and, and to me, controlling spending is just like, I don't know, when I was running for office, I just sort of said, yeah, of course we have to do that. It's like, I was like a given to me. It's not even like a, a something to negotiate. But the other aspect is clearly to generate revenue. I mean, we obviously have got to, you know, really bolster economic development in the city. And, and in my mind, that means we're updating our general plan. We are on the upswing. We're doing it before the economy fully turns around. And we need to expand our economic development department and planning department so that they can actually implement that plan. Because right now with two staff in a city of 117,000, it's just not enough. So those two things, and, and we've given more, we've actually um, allocated more money this year to expand the economic development department. And I hope future councils will continue to do that because the, you know th we need people that can actually implement that plan and go out and do the business attraction because one or two people in that department can't do it alone by any stretch. Well, and also remember it, like I said, when 05, when I was elected, the the it was extremely um, bad relationships with our employee unions, and, and they were in a grand jury report. They said it. They were playing games with the city um, on city time. Um, it, it was a really ugly situation. Vallejo had a lot of um, uniquenesses. I, I was on a, a panel um, at the League of California Cities, and um, with uh, the mayor of San Bernardino and a council member from Stockton. And we it were interesting to see the similarities that we had, but then there was also these differences that that Vallejo had. And and I think at the time, in '05, the uh, the unions had just gained so much power in this vacuum that the city really wasn't in control. And I think part of the future is making sure that we the city is in control because we should be. We are elected by you to be in control, but also that we have labor harmony. That we, that we find some peaceful relationships so we're not always having to fight it out and we can focus together on all these other things. That's gonna be another, another ticket to the future. I just wanna say, I was at that panel um, in the audience watching all three electeds from three different bankrupt cities or for, former bankrupt city talking about the things that were different and similar and the one thing that was similar was unsustainable labor contracts. Uh, JD, did you want to say anything about that? And then we have some more questions. Take the questions. Okay. And then we'll see if JD Miller. If you watch council meetings, you'll see him all the time. <laughs> he comes. He comes up and gives us economic um, lessons. Budget lessons. Budget lessons. Um, and he's usually quite right. So I know I've had. Okay, Anne. But then we have. You were in the back, um, Judy, and then. Okay. Hello, are we on? Okay, um, Ann Carr, most of you know me. Um, so I have two questions about binding interest arbitration. Um, from the Measure A campaign, one of the things that was mentioned is that only 25 cities out of 479 California cities have it codified. So I'm curious, you know, what do the other 450 cities do for contracts and you know, why can't we do that? Um, and, and the second question is, is if you can have any insight as to why Jumpstart wants to reinstate binding arbitration. Um, to my knowledge, we actually haven't finished a contract negotiation without it. So we had 41 years with it. We haven't actually done any contracts without it. Seems like we ought to give it a try. I'll, I'll. 
Um, well, uh, um, the other cities, that's the other 95% of the cities in the state of California do exactly what we're doing right now, which is you, you go through a process of good faith bargaining and negotiating at the table. And um, if there's an impasse at the table, ultimately those elected officials make the final decision. Um, there are, I mean, because you did elect them to office and labor contracts of employees are part of our public budget that you pay for. So it makes sense that I be a held accountable, right, and not an arbitrator from Wisconsin. I'm just thinking here out loud. Maybe, maybe some of you would like that idea better, but I think it's better to hold me accountable, Stephanie and the rest of the council accountable. So there are other, you know, there are other aspects of, of when there's disagreements in labors. You know, there's uh, PERB, the public employee, I can't remember what it's, state board for um, you know any kind of disputes or relations um, relation you know labor relation disputes that is another you know state process that you can go through and, and labor unions can go through to try to have their disputes um, objectively looked at so there are a number of other means for um, you know working out those uh, possible labor disputes or, or disagreements, including labor contracts. Um, and the other piece of your question was, um, oh, um, you know, I've been asking myself that question too, because what I've heard over and over again is that it's hardly ever been used. So if it's hardly ever been used, why do we need it back? I, I don't know. I can say why. <laughs> um, Binding interest arbitration, as Marty had mentioned, um, when you do go, um, is ruled generally rules in favor of unions. And you don't, the arbitrator doesn't get to decide between, like, well, I'll take this bit from the city's offer and this bit from the union's offer. It's the last, best, and final offer from each side that they just have to pick one. And so each side kind of gives these, you know, their outrageous, you know, their, their biggest um, offers and, and it's it's uh, it's 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 not a way to to negotiate. It's um, it's often used as a cudgel over the heads of council members. I've had that over my head. I know people who say I'm lying. It's not true. It, it happens because you don't want to have to go into binding interest arbitration because cities will likely lose. We lost when we went to binding interest arbitration be, when we were heading into bankruptcy. The city said no more deferrals, no more raises. And so we had to make cuts to the fire department. They took us to binding interest arbitration. We lost. We had to make up for that money in our budget, plus give all these S to raises, plus, plus, plus. That really was the starting point for going into bankruptcy. And that was all based on an arbitrator who didn't know Vallejo, didn't care really to know Vallejo. They don't have to know our budget. They don't have to know who you are. They don't know, have, to, have to know what your neighborhoods are like or how many police we have on the street. They just make their decision. And so um, it's great for labor. That's why they want it on there, because they usually can get what they want. Without it, we can hopefully make it good for both of us, get, get agreements that are good for the public and good for the unions at the same time, and not have to use this cudgel fighting thing. So. I, I, I want to add one thing, too, that, that you know, keep in mind that all of the things that happen in closed session, including personnel matters and labor negotiations, litigation or potential litigation, real estate acquisitions or um, selling of real estate, it all happens in closed session. You will never see minutes. You will never see a video. Mark's not coming into closed session to videotape that. You never get any of that. And so there's an awful lot of policy direction that is given to staff to the buildup to when it finally comes out and it's a done deal, whether it's a labor contract or it's a real estate deal, it's it doesn't matter, whatever it is. When it finally comes out, the truth is the council pretty much knows how they're going to vote because we just spent months and months giving policy direction with staff going out with their marching orders working on any one of those three topics I just mentioned. And so when you finally get to see it, it's once and it's the night we're going to vote for those kinds of items. And so because there's no video and because there's no minutes, you really have to be confident that the people that are sitting in closed session giving really huge direction, uh, labor contracts are 80% roughly of our budget, you, you need to be confident that the people that are sitting in closed session have your best interests at heart and are thinking about all of you. 
And, and I'll just uh, use the example of the past, which I know the mayor doesn't like me to use it, and I'm not using it to be mean, I'm using it as an example. In, in bankruptcy, when we were renegotiating the police contract, um, they, they agreed to a contract early, um, before the judge um, had ruled on whether a contract could be voided or not in bankruptcy. And they gave the police a contract with basically hardly any changes, plus raises for two years and 100% um, and paid health care in the city. And, um, you know, I was there. I believe that a lot of that had to do with the majority of the council who had answered that question. If we endorse you, will you stay bought? So you have to, like Marty said, make sure that the people who are negotiating behind those closed doors are doing it on, on your behalf. Um, and if not, then I think you know what you have in there is you have the employees, you have the council who's representing those labor unions, and then you don't have the public, when really the council should not be representing anyone but the public. So perhaps the public needs to come into those negotiations then. Make it more make it make it more fair. Hello. Uh, I'd like to start off by saying that uh, um, during the LNG crisis, there were some people who spoke up in favor of the LNG plant because they felt it would um, uh, bring jobs to Vallejo, and for whatever reason, I personally didn't agree with them. But I think it's very important to respect your opponents and and just believe that everybody is uh, dealing in good faith, unless you have evidence otherwise. Uh, my question is, what's the alternative to the body arbitration? Um, do the uh, do we go to the courts as an alternative? Us, we're it. We have it right now. It's it's Myers Millie's Brown Act. Um, the the state law, reg, you know, is is what the other ninety five percent of the cities use, and um, whether you have arbitration or not, there's always going to be litigation. Unfortunately. Okay. So so uh, it's not a choice between going to court and being sued, or deal, or you know expensive lawyers and court cases. It's actually a, uh, it actually binding arbitration. Can you can still sue even though you have binding arbitration? They wouldn't want to because they typically get what they want. But again, look at the court fee, the legal fees that we raised going bankrupt because we lost in binding arbitration. But if, if didn't have that control. Could you not then sue if you lost in binding arbitration? If you we, the city, the couldn't sue. Okay. And but the that's unions. Why that's why it's called binding. It's done. Okay. It's a done deal. Um, so when we lost the fire arbitration, for example, we were stuck with it, and so we had to to go into our budget and figure out, okay, how are we going to afford this? And of course, that had to come in the form of cuts to services to the public. That's so, how you paid for it. So so it's it you no. So this will strengthen the city council decisions and anything, if there's ever a dispute, it will have to be resolved in a uh, court of law. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, Judy, right here, and then David. Oh, you were there too. Um, okay, Judy. Yeah. Hello, hello. I'm Judy Irvin, and some of you know me because um, I've been sort of a thorn in people's side. Um, yes, you have. I've been, <laughs> I'm an architect and an urban planner, and I've been doing this for a long time. Before I retired from the National Park Service, I was one of the transition planners for the, for the Presidio of San Francisco. So I know how um, properties like this in base closure can be used effectively and be a part of the community, and I've been absolutely appalled at what I've seen. It's, I, I couldn't believe it when I got here. But my question's not that. My question is, We've made that base, that was our only engine. We got lazy, people got lazy, and that was it. They just waited for the money to show up. Uncle Sam became our only benefactor. So when the Navy left, we sort of made a choice, a, a Hobbesian choice. We chose HUD instead of the, of the, of the federal payroll from the Navy. And so we started making deals on bringing more poverty, more Section 8. So now we're in this situation, and I know this is something we, this is the big elephant in the room. We're in this situation, I've been trying to get my handle on this because something I really don't know, and I find out from HUD that, oh my God, there are target levels. 30% is kind of a toxic level for poverty. And now we have 59% of our housing in the downtown is subsidized. And although the housing authority will tell us, no, 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 they only count 
the Housing Choice vouchers, HUD tells me they are indeed in charge of the project-based vouchers. So they're not telling us the whole story. So what's so the question? My question is, how in the hell do we get out of this mess? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, first of all, I think it's hugely difficult to get out of this mess, especially with the affordable house concentration in the downtown. But one, you know, potential possible way that, and I know this won't be palatable to pretty much maybe nobody in this room, is, is that, you know, those affordable housing projects in the downtown and other parts of the city, they have contracts with an expiration date. And there is the possibility when those dates come up of not reinstating them. Now, there's an awful lot of carrots for reinstating them. And so it's really, sometimes it's, it's really difficult to, to do that. I don't even remember that project that we reinstated two years ago because it was so, com yeah, we had no choice because I don't even remember the details. I have to jettison stuff after I <laughs> like, read it and vote on it. But um, it, all I can say is that they're, they're actually, it just it becomes really difficult because of all the different regulations that are built into those contracts and, um, and then the city feeling an obligation to maintain a certain amount of affordable housing based on um, our arena numbers, regional housing needs allocation numbers. Um, so I, you know, I, the only thing that I can think of off the top of my head that c could work is to start, as those contracts come up with HUD, um, to start not reinstating them. Well, I, I think also, I, I, I wouldn't say that we went from the Navy to HUD. You know, we, we did have things like Marine World, um, at the time Six Flags, um, and uh, apparently there's an opportunity for a mall that was passed up. We had opportunities um, for, for more economic development. But I, I think also what it will take, Judy, is having a council, and, and we did this recently, where that one developer wanted to, Seabreeze, turn the project into 100% or close to af affordable, and, and we said no. So I, I think, um, and, that, and that wasn't just the council majority. I think, do we have unanimous, unanimous vote on that one? So I, I think it's just having your council have a recognition or close to unanimous. You're shaking your heads. Okay. I'm shaking my head because when that, that night when that happened, Mr. Widom said to you, I, I'll paraphrase because I can't remember it per, per data, but it was basically, are you saying you don't want us to come with, back to you with any more like this? Right. And it was like, how obtuse are you? I got it, David. David, right. Yes, um, I, I think staff has gotten the message that, that the city, the citizens and, and council are getting tired of, of more affordable housing. We do get sued. We are being watched very closely by affordable housing advocates, so we do have to you know, follow that line. But I think having a council that recognizes that there's too much of a concentration and too much of it, and to kind of push back and push back on the numbers on those requirements for us. About the sea breeze thing, I just want to say, you know, whenever somebody comes forward with an application, staff can't say, you know what, we read the tea leaves and we already know how the council is going to answer. So if somebody wants to, for example, put in an application for a general plan amendment to change the zoning somewhere, staff can't say, you know what, I'm pretty sure the council won't like that project. That is illegal. And it's the same thing with this application for sea breeze. You know, it's a similar thing. They have a right to apply and put us in the position of having to say yes or no. And staff really, and it's not appropriate for them to make that decision for us. So in, just in fairness. Okay, so I think we have over here, and then we have right here. So you, you wanna come up? Oh, David, you keep raising your hand and pointing to people. I have no idea who. You're kinda going like this, so that doesn't help. <laughs> Yeah. Hi, I'm JoLynn Halstead, and I'm new. Uh, I just arrived here not more than three weeks ago, oh, bought a house oh. here. <laughs> I actually made a conscientious choice to move from Napa to be here in a more bohemian community. <laughs> My commitment is to children and families. And really, I'm here tonight, not because I'm political, because really I'm very ignorant. And I know a few of you here, and I, have, I know a few faces, um, a few good faces that I've reached out and gotten to know. So 
My question, I have two questions. I have one because I looked on the website and I found one question that I thought I would ask, which is, um, it says the proposed amendments would change the city's general municipal, municipal elections from odd number to even numbered years, and I'm, I wonder why. So that's my first question. Um, and my second question is, what can I do as a committed person? Because I know that this is more than political. For really uh, sitting here, I can listen to all the binding arbitration and all that stuff, but really, who am I as a human being here in this community? I'm here for a reason. I want to take it out into the world. I'm a marketing person. I want to collect people. I want to collect community. I want people to be around me that I like to be around, and I see faces, and I see eyes, and I connect with people, and that's my commitment in this community. So I want to know what I can do. So first of all, um, what's the deal with the odd-numbered and even-numbered years, and how does it affect me? Because that's the first thing that's going to happen to me. And the second thing is, what one thing in two sentences can I do to make a difference? Okay. I'll start. Um, the odd even change is because the rest of the county is on the even years and for us to have our elections on the odd years it costs the city more money. So that's the reason for the change. Um, I do have concerns about that myself um, just because well, we're talking about special interest money right now. Um, when we change to even years our elections are going to get drowned out by the state and federal elections that um, that send out a lot of materials and overwhelms our mailboxes and everything else. And, um, and also, you know, uh, candidates who are endorsed by a party can, you know, lock on to those, um, those candidates running. Like, uh, for example, the last one, I think Aaron Hannigan was running for county supervisor and had President Obama's um, logo on her, one of her materials. So people who aren't paying attention will, can see that and go, oh yeah, I'm voting for Obama, so I'll vote for her. So I do have worries about that, but you know, the people have to be smart and, and follow the money and, and think for themselves. It saves us money. Um, and what was the other? What two? It's not you, Pamela. Yeah. I, I think you're doing it right now. Um, that's, that's finding out the issues and, and before checking boxes, knowing what you're checking and why. I, I applaud you for asking that question. I haven't been asked that yet. Um, but also, I think beyond the election, um, there, are definitely, there's, there, there are people here that are involved in so many different community organizations, whether it's painting out graffiti or we have Better Vallejo, we have Better Vallejo who's working on community projects. We have lots of different participatory budgeting. There's lots of things depending on your interest. Neighborhood watch groups. We have a huge number now of neighborhood watch groups. Um, and, and also, you know, just getting involved with the city. We're, we're increasing our volunteer program if you're interested in, you know, volunteering in, in the police department, um, for example, or, or, different, or different departments. So it depends on your interest and your time. But Vallejo is a place where you can, you can really make a change. You can be one person that can make big change. That's the one thing I, I've learned and I've loved about Vallejo, that you know, it doesn't matter. If, you know, it doesn't matter that you're one of 116,000. One person can make a change. I'm only going to add that there are so many volunteers in here on so many different initiatives. I want everybody to cost her right after this and sign her up for her favorite cause. City council, this city council has a little bit like a little bit too short, but I'm thinking on the education. Great. Okay, you've been waiting for a long time. Sorry. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your service. Really. really. And um, I moved my business about 10 years ago. And also, I moved, moved here because I love many things about Vallejo. And I love the diversity. I love the richness. But it seems to me, of being a relative newcomer, 10 years or whatever, is that it's a city of a lot of band-aids. And that things are, you know, it's almost like this will be the band-aid, that'll be the band-aid, and these pieces. And I'd like to hear your thoughts coming from your perspectives of 
how you feel we can bring a, a whole vision, if you will, and maintain that vision for Vallejo rather than band-aiding it all the time. Yes, you're exactly right. Piecemealing. Um, we've piecemealed for a long time. I think the general plan update is a perfect example. You know, I think probably every single one of us in this room have said for years that you know, we've had a general plan that was 30, 30 years old. In 1983, the last time it was updated. Yeah, I was, I was just in high school. Um, so, it, and, and your general plan really is, is your, your, your guide, your, you know, how the city is going to grow. And, and it also, because ours is so old and outdated, we often get, you know, development proposals that really don't fit in the areas anymore because of the way we've grown, because we haven't updated that. So the general plan update, and which I encourage everybody to get involved in, because that is going to be our vision for the future, and that will create that cohesiveness. And it also, I think, reduce a lot of the, the problems with having developments being proposed in areas that just aren't appropriate. I would just add, you know, I, I'm an urban planner, so I'm really excited about the general plan update. I plan to be very engaged in that as I exit council. Um, but I think, as Stephanie said, that is a huge piece of it. We also did an economic strategy study, cluster study, which you could go and add another word to that after, <laughs> which we do all the time. Sorry, but it just, it always, always is on the tip of my tongue. But anyways, the study um, actually identified four areas in the city, education, tourism, health, and light industry and manufacturing as sort of the four assets the city already has. And what we need to do is just build on what we already have. And I think one of the great things about that study, the outcome, was the fact that, um, the fact that uh, it just reinforced for all of us, what I think we already know are the assets that we have. I mean, there was no surprises there. So it was really great to, you know, get all arrows moving in the same direction, if you will, thinking about how to move the city forward in terms of economic development. So I think those two things are the biggest things that are really going to shift because by doing the general plan and, you know, economic development plan together as a community where we co create a collective vision, not just the vision of one or two groups, a collective vision of how we want to grow and increase revenue and do economic development and business in the city, we are just going to be so much stronger for it and I think it's going to get us all moving in the same direction. Okay, David and then JD. Oh wait, oh I'm, no, I'm sorry. Monica. David, you go and then Monica okay. and then JD. So um, one of the things that down. I wanted to talk to you about is that um, you hit it on the nail, I hit the hit nail on the head with um, talking about power, talking about power. And, um, you know, the thing, when I started looking back at binding arbitration, it seems like that this was a, a um, feature that came out of uh, a police strike that was held, that was 1968, 1969, and that that was the answer was binding arbitration that was put in place and that we lived with it then with 41 years. But I think the thing that's most telling to me is I went back to look because I wasn't here back then. And um, you know, that, that what I wanted to see was you know, what has been done with it. And, and like you said, you know, that there have been supporters and proponents of this slate which have talked about we don't really need binding arbitration. It's never been used. Um, if we had binding arbitration now, we might would probably have a contract. These kind of things that have been floated out there and how binding arbitration is really the answer to our problems. But in the last forum that I went to, what was really telling to me is that the four Jumpstart candidates, when asked that question, would you support putting binding arbitration back on the ballot, those were the only four candidates which answered anything other than absolutely not. And candidate Platzer, you were not in that um, in that forum. He's gone. He was the only one. Him and Malpalo were the only two in that that were not in that uh, group. Asked that question, but every single other candidate said absolutely not. The people spoke about this, and and so you know when you look back at um, at at the absence of power, or if you look at you know what people say about power and absolute power corrupts and that it corrupts absolutely, absolutely that, that what we've seen is that, that there was a very powerful um, police group which went as far as to strike in Vallejo in 1968. Binding arbitration was put on in place and 25 times, 
in 41 years that that was used and 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 that we normally were the losing group and what right, I and remember that it was used but then it was threatened a lot more right and and it seems like that the people have been on the losing end of this power struggle for many many years and now that 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 power has tipped more in favor of what I would say is to the people that 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 there seems to be this very um, strong effort to get that power back and that and that even so so what I'm saying I guess is that when I see four candidates only those candidates saying I'm not willing to say that I would not put binding arbitration back on the ballot my question is what would those what would those same candidates do behind closed doors when when the negotiations start taking place and, yeah. and what I'm looking for is for the power to come back towards the side of people as opposed to the side of organizations or the side of, 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 of where it has been. The binding arbitration question was there, if we endorse you, will you stay bought? That was, that was their version of it. They're, they got, I think, a little smarter and didn't ask quite so baldly. But, um, but you're right. I mean, that's... That's, it's, it is about power, and, and I think the only way you can ensure that you have candidates that are representing the people is if they're elected by the people. I don't know if many people in here have worked on a campaign before. How many people have worked on a campaign before? Okay, if you have, you know it's really, really hard to raise money if you're not getting $8,000 from a real estate pack in Los Angeles or $5,000 from San Francisco firefighters, or whatever from Valpac, and whatever from um, VPOA, and however much from IAFF, you know, gosh, to be able to get $5,000 um, donations to a campaign and not to have to have fundraisers every other Friday night and ask our supporters to continually pull money out of their pockets, but that's the only way you're going to know that you have you have people representing people. Like I've I've never I don't see myself as a politician. I'm a citizen politician. I, I don't I'm I'm not in it to to make or gain anything, and I haven't promised anything to anyone. And I've and I've also had to vote against things that you all wanted. I've had to be in that chamber, and you guys were mad at me. But just because you supported supported me, I didn't promise you I'd do what you would, you wanted me to do. And that's what you want. Well, before you get it, because you might want to answer this, but, but the Reuters article that I read says Vallejo is in danger of going into bankruptcy a second time if it doesn't get its retirement and its benefits packages under control and that in, the, in, in, in our next you know, negotiations. And so you know, what I want to see is I want to see people in those rooms that are, that are representing my interests and that are representing the people's interests as opposed to some organization's interests. Well, as, as we said at the, at the top of the hour, whenever we started, we, we're just not going to discuss labor. You know, we're in the middle of negotiations and it just wouldn't be appropriate to discuss labor contracts. But I'm going to take this opportunity to do one of those things that sometimes that, that you know, when reporters ask you a question, you don't want to answer it, and then you go somewhere else with the answer. I'm going to do one of those right now. Cause, and, it, and it's not in fairness to Chris, who's left the room. It's not because it, Chris left the room. But I want to point out special interests, as we've talked about, there's lots of ways in which special interests come to you in a, you know, a candidate or a slate of candidates. And it isn't um, just some of the you know, situations we just described. But you know, uh, support the poor candidate, um, Chris Platzer, it, you know, is, is pretty much com entirely funded by the Mare Island Rail Service. And I can't discuss it other than to say what's public, which is we are being sued. And so I can say that by the Mare Island Rail Service. I can say that. And I'll just let that sit and settle with all of you. I, my, my opinion is if, if somebody sues me, I don't think that they're probably a good business partner to go do business with again, just saying. Um, and the, the other thing I'd say is, is that part of w what has come out of this support the, the port idea is the idea that it would be a port district. So anybody that knows about districts, they are taxed. So districts, I don't know, who do you think would be taxed with a port district in Vallejo? I'll let you guys guess. Um, so there's, there's <laughs> that issue. And then the third issue about a port district is, in addition, is that they basically operate like their own little city. 
Oakland's port or Oakland has a port district, Stockton. And so they kind of have their own rules and regulations and they don't have to follow all the regulations and zoning and all those kinds of permitting that a city does. So to have one person, one entity, one organization, one company behind one candidate fully funding them um, and one issue is the same thing as all everything else that we've been talking about. It's very, very dangerous to not, just like your portfolio, you need to diversify those people that fund your campaigns. Okay. Monica, finally, sorry. And then JD, and then, and then uh, My Gregory. I can carry this room. I'm sorry. I know, you can. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Monica. I tend to be a futurist, not a pastist. Is that <laughs> a word? Um, I have spent 35 years in education one way or another, not as a student, my professional life. I want to thank you both, first of all, for the fine service that you've done and for providing a springboard so that we can be looking at the future once again. When I first moved here, all I heard about was the LNG plant and all that was going on. I researched it carefully and realized that yet again, we were um, being presented with a 20th century industry and uh, we were headed into the 21st. We have seen several 20th century products brought to us as though they were the greatest new invention since the, t the Apple IIe. <laughs> so um, one of the things that I am particularly wanting to address right now is the young man who came up and asked about the school district. I think there's a fact that uh, people don't realize is that school districts, all, I'm a, a retired school administrator. Um, school districts are very generously subsidized when there is uh, a military base or military dependents attending their school district. Since the vast majority of the students were the children of either civilian or active duty um, military families, the school district relied almost exclusively on the additional funding. Therefore, not only did the city of Vallejo suffer terribly when the Navy left, so did the school district. And uh, again, as we begin to look at all of the things that you folks addressed during your term, um, I am feeling very much compelled to say that the level of activism that we see happening around the city, uh, should we, looking toward the future, we may want to be taking a look at creating a closer partnership between the school district and the city, and um, that we need to be paying attention to the people who are going to be pushing our wheelchairs. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Um, so again, this is primarily a love letter to you two and to the council, by the way, to uh, who for hiring um, a brilliant city manager, Dan Keene. Thanks, ladies. Monica brings up an excellent point. That's another thing you could do is run for school board. Because that is something that is overlooked. Um, Monica brings up an excellent point. We talk about city council candidates and getting people on the city council, but Vallejo will not rise unless our schools rise with us. So um, we really, truly need good people to run for that school board. So please consider it. Anyone can do You don't have to have kids to be on the school board. I don't have children. I think I would do a good job. Not that I'm going to do it. Eight years here has been quite a lot. Um, JD, you are next. Okay, and then Gregory, and then you up front. Okay, JD, we're gonna limit you. Yeah, well, that, yeah. I got that. I'll do the, if for anybody that wants the, the, the finance story, I'd be very happy to stay later or finish this up with a retarded amoeba, amoeba approach to finance so that you can all understand it. But all I, I wanted to, to make two comments. First of all, um, I was one of the signers of the petition to remove binding arbitration from the charter. I could talk ad nauseum about the damage that binding arbitration did to, to the city, including it was the first step, uh, you hit the nail on the head, uh, losing that uh, final binding arbitration uh, and, and forcing the city to come up with $4.2 million 
it was that was the, the death knell right there. There was no recovery. Uh, bankruptcy was just a given. And th that kind of an adjunct. Uh, I served on the Citizens Budget Advisory Committee back in 92-93, and in our report, we told them at that time, if they didn't change how they spent our money, we were afraid they'd end up in bankruptcy. Now, that was in 1993. Uh, the, the, yeah. We didn't want it to happen. Uh, but anyway, uh, as I said, I'll do a retarded amoeba approach to finance if you, if you want to stick around afterwards. But I wanted to, to give another, another perspective, another financial perspective on the uh, Measure E, uh, which is to change the, um, the, the election cycle for city council to the even years. And I strongly recommend don't vote for it. Now, it, true, it would save the equivalent of the pay of one police officer, roughly a quarter of a million dollars, that's salary and benefits. However, it will totally decimate your ability to make a difference in your community. With the odd year uh, elections right now, we come into an election and virtually the only thing that's on the ballot are things that you should be caring about this city. So encourage your friends, neighbors, everybody, vote no on Measure E. Sure, there's a quarter million dollars that the city could, quote, save. However, that's your investment in the future of your city. If you vote, if that passes, you will have it removed a very strong um, a tool that you could use to make your city better. Yeah, Jay, thank you. I thought I was the lone wolf and being concerned about that. You said it better than I did, so thank you. Um, I, I th the thing that you're speaking about, too, is it's going to make campaigns super duper, quadruple duper expensive. Yeah. Um, you think it's hard now, but when you're running with all these other issues and things on the slate, you've got to get attention. It really is, and you're going to be competing with people who are funded by the special interests and the people who are running at the same time. So it, it, it really could be devastating. So uh, Gregory, and then this gentleman up front. Uh, I too want to say thank you for your service. And, um, and that was a great segue because I want to say thank you to a whole lot of the people in this room who've been showing up for these fundraisers like crazy. Um, you know, Skip and I keep throwing them for everybody, and, um, and I feel like I know almost every single person in this room, so I want to say thank you to all of you for caring and, and participating and deep, uh, digging into your pocket to help pay for grassroots. Um, LMG was a big lesson for us all. Um, it really did kind of see where those strange bedfellows were. Um, but I love the fact that the Monica has got us talking about the future. And I would like you to talk a little bit, if you could, about the spirit of the city, the, the may you in which we work, the idea that we have to be a welcoming city. Um, I want to personally thank you for your work recognizing Gay and Lesbian Month in June for the last few years. I also think it's really important that we, I'm getting choked up. I think it's really important that we honored the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King, and specifically Byron Rustin and his role in organizing that. And I, again, want to thank you specifically for your help on that. Um, there is a candidate running who does not believe in my civil rights. And I believe that the engines for economic redevelopment in this city are going to be artists and gays working in hand with the rest of the community to, to create studios and artists and art on our, on our sidewalks and you know walk down the streets of other places and see how other people are welcoming. And we'll get those high tech companies to come to town because their people will want to live in a city that's welcoming. And, and, and I would like you to talk to the fact that we have a real choice in this city right now about going back in time, not to the 21st century, back to the 18th century. Um, or looking forward to creating a community that welcomes everyone, including me and my kind. Um, Marty and I said that we wouldn't speak about individual candidates, um, but I, I, and I won't, but who you're talking about is Anthony Summers. 
Um, that's all I'll say. Um, but you're right, and, and one of the things I've been working with um, Mr. Keenan is going to be coming on the agenda. I'm going to ask my fellow council members before I leave is to update our non-discrimination policy in the city because it's extremely fragmented and it doesn't include um, sexual orientation. Um, and I think it's a, it's a matter of, of being and thinking. It's like last night we had an anti-bullying week proclamation and it mentioned you know the, the, the groups that are bullied and, um, and that we won't accept won't accept it and it didn't list um, sexual orientation or religion actually um, as, as and, and I asked to have that included so I think um, that looking forward I think you're right I think this someone I remember where she was who said she just moved here um, because we're bohemian um, I, I, I think that's kind of what you're talking about. Vallejo's got this fabulous mixture. It's really cool. And that's what I love the most about it. It's new people who move in with this excitement. And um, it's the gay community that's moved in and just dug in their heels and gotten involved and are contributing. And it's also old Vallejo. It's, it's, it's retired folks from the Navy that still live here and love the city and want to make it better. Um, it's, it's the Maureen Moores, it's people who've been, you know, fighting this fight for a long time. So I, I think it's about everyone coming together and, and it's like I said at the beginning, um, when I first started I had to be, it was divisive, I had to be. Um, towards the middle end of my, of my second term it's time to mend those, those problems. And, and move together. I've had to work with Osby and figure out how to do that, and we have. And I think you have to work with what you have. But what we want to do is elect people who will say, hey, wait a minute, there's sexual orientation is not listed in this, in this proclamation, or you know, bringing forth new progressive ideas that would you know, be, make the city more welcoming to different um, populations, different people. Um, and, and I agree, it's, I just, I love the thought of, of us being um, this, uh, the, the whole art, you know, downtown, bring our downtown back alive and, and the waterfront. We can, we talk about the P word and we're really ready to grab it right now. We really are, I think, coming out of bankruptcy, if we can, if we can continue to have some, this positive movement with people who, who are representing people, I think we can make that P word become potential and become reality. So this election to me means everything. It's now or never. It's do or die. Now is the time to continue this progress that we've made or jump back. Um, I, you know, I would just add, you know, Stephanie and I are, are an interesting team together. Um, Stephanie, you know, is, is really good at seeing, in, in particular, like zeroing in on what needs to be responded to in the community when, when there's an injustice that's going on in our community. And she does it very quickly. She goes from zero to 60 in like less than five seconds. And, um, and you know, like, and I'm gonna use this as an example. Last year when um, there was an, a, an entity that was trying to recall us, and it was right away, we got to meet, we got to respond, and I was kind of like, can I just keep working on what I'm working on? I don't want to do that, you know? And so I'm more the kind of person who's like, always got my rose-colored glasses on, let's do participatory budgeting, let's update the general plan. You know, I just want to go out and do like all the fun stuff. And you know, I get dragged back like, okay, you're right, we got to, we got to respond exactly. We got to re, you know, respond to injustice in the community. And I agree with Stephanie. I feel like we're really at this sort of, you know, kind of precipice in terms of, you know, either you know, jumping back or moving forward in a positive direction. And I think we've done an awful lot of positive things in the last couple of years. And I am going to say this anyways, <laughs> even though you heard a lot from me already. You know, to me, participatory budgeting is actually part about doing exactly what Stephanie just said, is getting all the different groups of people working together, meeting each other and going, oh, I didn't know that you're interested in health and children and working on a project together. And then the next thing you know, they're doing something else together and they never knew each other before something like PB. So there's numerous examples that I could cite like that and actually Joey Lake 
as the chair of the PB steering committee could cite over and over again. But you know, there are a bunch of different things. Better Vallejo, another place that's bringing people together from you know, NAACP, different groups. And we need more of that happening in the city. And we need to continue to build on what we've already started, either with civic organizations that are doing that work or things that we've started in the city that's helping to facilitate that work so we can keep moving forward and build the kind of community that is inclusive and about justice. As one of my friends said, PBJ, right? He said, is the J for justice? And I thought, yeah, I think it is. I, I also want to note that, you know, we t we're talking about jump back, I mean, jump start. <laughs> oh, that's a, sorry. Um, we, we're talking a lot about it as a group, I, I think when we talk about this move, moving forward and these, these mending of, of wounds and things, I would hope that we can do that with labor. I hope that we can do that with the chamber. I hope that we can do that with the folks that are supporting Jumpstart, um, no matter what happens, because ultimately we really do have to work together or it's going to just be that cluster word that Marty didn't want to say. So um, we do have to have to move in that direction. Okay, so where are we on time? I think people are looking tired. Oh, 8, 12. Oh, we still have a few minutes if people still want to ask questions. Oh, you poor thing. You've been sitting there. Sorry, I just could not get involved. Uh, <laughs> I try to do th that too. This gentleman here brought up an interesting word that intrigues me. It was power. <clears throat> and you guys brought me here because of the word special interest. And before I go any further, I want to say, although we've not always seen the same way, I definitely, yeah, it's on. Pull it up <clears throat> I definitely honor that what you've done, what you've tried to do, how you've worked at the council when the periods that I showed up at the council and had issues that I wanted to address. And so in that regard, I think you have been wonderful people for the city. On to my question. The special interest power and direction from on high that's, that got brought up by several different people bothers me because of state regulations that were mentioned because they preclude what you can do as a council person. And some of the ones that bother me are AB 32 and SB 375. Uh, the climate change planning that we had to do for a 55 inch sea rise, it's not really going to happen, but we paid big money to do that. The Cal Green 24 zoning that comes with all that planning, that changes how we have to do building, renovation, and a lot of things in Vallejo that nobody has yet realized. And then the One Bay Area plan, which is a regionalization, uh, 214 priority development, i.e. low cost housings, of which Vallejo is a target for them, and $466 million to throw in our faces to force us to go their way. Uh, those kinds of things are issues that, while I honor what the gentleman said, I, I think the council is going to get carrots dangled, the newcomers are going to get carrots dangled, they're going to get oh, the Pied Piper attraction of these kinds of things which don't do our city any good, which don't move us forward, which don't help us become the bohemian, everybody works together and appreciates one another community that I think we want to be. Thank you. And, and I think that's, that's, again, goes back to electing council members who are smart and who can, you know, make reasonable choices. Things come before us all the time. Used to be very rubber stamped, but, um, you know, like Marty says, I mean, we, we do our homework now. I always, I always question why. I don't just read it and say, oh, there's the staff report. I always kind of go, hmm, what, what's behind that? So you got to have someone that's, that's people up there that are going to take that extra step to, um, to be suspicious. I'm not the rose-colored glasses person. I, 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 suspicious is a bad word. I don't think people are doing bad things. But um, skeptical. Skeptical. skeptical, thank you. Skeptical. I think it's important to be skeptical when you're an elected official. Um, and, and that's how you, you can hopefully avoid falling into pitfalls. I just want to add quickly, sorry, to that, that I also think, you, you can come up to the mic because we, we'd like you to. I just wanted to show you that Katie is here because I don't think you guys Oh, and we have another candidate. Yes, thank you. Katie Meisner running for city council is here. Okay. 
I, I just wanted to add to that that I think, um, well, I'm not, I'm not here pitching tonight that you make us a full-time council. I will say this, that it is uh, the cumulative impact on your life to try to um, not only pay attention to what's happening in the city, but all the regional stuff, the state stuff that may or may not impact the city, um, to do that and then hold a full-time job. And in, in my case, and in Stephanie's case, actually, we have a whole other level of politics that we have to deal with. I have to watch Sacramento politics. I have three elected officials I have to work with there. I have to be looking at what's going on there and affecting my business district that I work in. Stephanie works for the federal government, for the Forest Service, so that she's always at the federal level also constantly looking at you know, federal policies. It's an enormous amount of information that I can't, even, I can't even begin to quantify for you. How much information comes into our inboxes, into our you know, hard copy mail and to keep up with all of that doing these two jobs and trying to also just focus on the city for things like the one bay area plan which i think is also very troubling um i, I don't i don't think you and i you know totally agree on some of the other things you listed and you know that gary that's okay but I, i'm just saying i i don't know how you keep track of of all of it and including in fairness to the school district, I mean, good questions about the school district. Somebody came up to me at my office hours about four months ago and said, you people need to work with the school district. And, you know, I had just put up my canopy by myself. It's 9 a.m. on a Saturday. I thought, I mean, my patience was like, is, is, it is this thin at this point on the council. I blew up at this person, this poor person. I just kind of said, in what spare time would I work with the school district? I work 60 miles away from here. It's, it's that kind of stuff that, you know, being able to pay attention to what you're talking about while really critical and important, it's just we are stretched so thin, I, I don't know how anybody could do it. Yeah, right, yeah. exactly. So I, I don't know what the answer is, and, you know, none of us have an office in City Hall, none of us have staff. Uh, the mayor has an executive assistant, as he, you know, I think he should. He's got a lot of ceremonial things that he needs to do. But the rest of us, you know, last summer, I finally said when I was unemployed, I said to, to Dan, I need a key to City Hall because I can't keep eating out for dinner to have meetings. I could do that when I was employed, but I can't do it now. And I finally, after two and a half years, got a key to City Hall so I could have meetings in his conference room. So it's little things, logistics like that, that might seem simple, but everything becomes so much work and logistically so difficult to do that and when you tack on all the regional and state politics you have to pay attention to read understand and figure out how it impacts us it's a, it's an enormous job that's all i can say and that's staff i mean as we increase our staff and we have this better city management i do believe that you know they should be helping the council do that they should be uh having a better watchful eye on what's happening in sacramento because we don't get any reports we'll get bills that all of a sudden are being passed and we're like what um, and, and it's true, there's just no physical way to, to do that. I mean, I tried, I got sick. Um, I, it, I tried, but you just simply can't work a job and do that. But I do think with Dan Keene that he's gonna start to change that a bit and help the council out a little bit more. And I, I do think the council should have an office, at least even one that we share, um, for God's sake. It's absolutely ridiculous. But if they had state bills on tape, I could listen to yeah. them on my commute, but I don't think they do that. Oh, that's just, oh, that's exhausting for me to think of. Yeah. It's like listening to C-SPAN. Hi, uh, my name is Patricia. Is this on or? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi. And uh, I worked for the California State uh, uh, Department of Conservation for over 20 years. So, you know, I know what it's like to be a public servant without enough staff with a, a lot of work to do. And so I really applaud what you have done, what the other city council members have done uh, as to service to the city and to the residents. Because while sometimes it seems like all the attention gets done to the uh, legislat California legislature, you know, the um, national offices, Locally is where things really impact residents. If there are potholes in the street, you know, sewer services, all these things that take a lot of money and we need staff who knows what they're doing and we need staff who responds to the residents. And so everybody has to be involved in some way. And like you were just saying, 
the amount of information and knowledge you need to know to do your job is simply overwhelming. And it's also overwhelming for the average citizen to think, I'd like to be involved. I, I feel like I'm, I'm not in the loop. I feel like I'm being passed over if I go in and make a statement. But I would, I would recommend that everybody gets involved in just if only one thing that's important to them. It's like I'm president of the Vallejo Heights Neighborhood Association, and we did one thing in 2012. We adopted Shevlin Park at the top of Coglin Hill in Vallejo Heights, and we put in a little flower garden. And I go up there a couple of times a week and work and sweep up, and, and we've changed things. Just in that one little area, we changed how people are looking at the park We've changed some of the negative things that are going on, because that's feedback I get from citizens. And when I'm working in the park, almost every time somebody will pull up and say, that's a beautiful flower garden. It looks so wonderful. Thank you for what you're doing. One little thing will make a difference. And I would urge everybody, find one little thing that you can do in the city of Vallejo that will make a difference. Thank and it you. will make that's a right. difference. That's definitely right. I, I'd also make a, a pitch for our, our new website. I know, um, you know, we as council members should be able to communicate more and, and try to explain things more. Like you said, it's, there's so many, it's so many confusing things that can come before us. But the city's website um, is new. It finally has some information you can actually find. And, um, and we have a new information officer um, that's going, public information officer, that's going to even make that better. So hopefully that, that can also help with the communication. Before we get close to wrapping up, I did want to say, I want to reiterate something Stephanie said, um, because I think it's so very, very important. Regardless of the outcome of the election, we will all have to work together as a community. We're all here, civic organizations, different groups, our, our labor groups in the city, and we really do need to recognize that, you know, at, at some point it's time to lay down the arms and reach across the table, shake hands and say, what can we work on together? What can we do together and go our separate ways and agree to disagree on the things that we have to disagree with? And, you know, uh, nobody's looking forward to November 6th, um, almost more, except maybe the candidates, they probably all are, because I remember that. Um, but I know I am too, because I would, because the rose colored glass council member would like to put down the arms and go back to working on the good positive stuff in the city. And I couldn't agree more with what Patricia just said, which is, you know, we all need to take our little spot in the world and, and try to, you know, clean it up and make it a better place. And together, ultimately, we'll have this beautiful quilt of the city of Vallejo that'll be this wonderful place that we all want to spend our time and our money in. Okay, do we have any last questions from anyone? Oh, we do. We started a little bit late, so. Thank you, Marty and uh, Stephanie. I just want to express my gratitude uh, as a budget delegate and as a community member to both of you for your services to the city and the people of Vallejo. Thank you, Marty, for uh, bringing PB to our city. And uh, uh, <laughs> we have over 5,000 new inspired volunteers, and we hope to make it 10,000. I'm a little saddened by your going away, Marty. I was hoping that you would become mayor and I can take your place. <laughs> I said this before, but thank you. May God bless you and may God protect you. For those of you who don't know, um, I am terming out. I've done two terms, so I am leaving. Um, and Marty has... Uh, Marty is um, <laughs> completing her first term, but, but not running again. So neither of us are up for election. That is another thing about coming before you tonight is that, you know, we're, we have no skin in that game in the sense of, of ourselves, um, just what we've done and wanting to make sure that things continue on. So thank you for doing this. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> So I think we've got all the questions out, and JD says he'll do his little amoeba thing, I think he called it, for anyone who wants to talk about budget. He really does know the budget really well. Um, so he can talk to you about that in the corner, and we'll be hanging out for a little bit. Again, I want to thank Natasha yeah. for hosting this here. Yeah. 
and M Natasha is a honey badger that I, I totally respect. She is a true honey badger, like Marty and I. And um, again, Mark Garman for, for putting this on VIB so more people can see it. And I'd like to make an announcement that on October 19th um, here at Dance Unlimited, there's going to be a meet and greet for the candidates from 10 to 12 p.m. and it's gonna be a potluck brunch. So everybody's welcome. You can, it's more of a, a, a chat with the candidates, ask some questions, get to know them. I think some of them have refused to come though, but hopefully um, we'll get more. Who's it sponsored by? Marion Swanson. Heritage. Heritage Neighborhood Association is sponsoring it. So thank you very much everybody for coming and participating.